and uh, experience the joy of having your spirit minister to us. And so, Lord, I thank you for your servant, uh, Dr. Pauline. Pray that you bless John in a mighty way. Just anoint him tonight. Anoint our ears that we might hear the special truth that you have for us for this time. Bless him, Lord, in all his ministry, but especially tonight. Lord, we, we look for a special blessing from your hand, and we ask this in Jesus' name, and let all God's people say, Amen. 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 I started out as a child. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> I walked like a child. I talked like a child. I thought like a child. But then I became a man and put away childish things. And I think sometimes in our faith, we too experience the early times in faith when it's oh so real and yet it is still sometimes as a little child. And when I was a child, my favorite thing was Uncle Arthur's Bible stories. Don't know if you remember that, but there were ten volumes, and I went back and forth, studied those from beginning to end, read them probably ten times by the time I was ten years old. I know, I was a strange child. But that was really precious to me. In fact, even in New York City, I actually went on radio shows where they had Bible contests. And uh, the knowledge that I had from Uncle Arthur's Bible stories was a tremendous advantage in those contests. And I remember particularly the story of Daniel, and I also liked the story of Esther and so on. And, and they were wonderful stories and, and they kept me going in the faith. But then I became a man. And I began to study the Bible as an adult. I discovered not everything that Uncle Arthur told me was exactly the way it was. We won't even get into the Esther story. But that was, uh, that was shock number one. And then I became a biblical scholar. I went to school to learn the Greek and the Hebrew and the Aramaic. And as I began reading the Bible, I began to see things that I had never been taught. See things that I had missed before. As a child, I loved the lion's den, the three friends in the fiery furnace, Nebuchadnezzar the beast. Remember that one? Yeah. Good stuff. But as an adult, I read the book of Daniel in Hebrew and Aramaic. And I saw things I had never seen before. And tonight, as part of our theme of reaching up, reaching in, reaching out, I want to take you back to the book of Daniel. I want to look at the book of Daniel again. See that big statue out there? I want to look at it again. Because when you look at those stories as an adult, you will see things that maybe as a child you could not have seen. So let's do a Bible study tonight. Let's go to some familiar texts, but to look at them with new eyes. And the first text I'd like you to turn to is Daniel chapter 2. That's the story of uh, this giant image. Daniel chapter 2 and verses 27 and 28. Daniel chapter 2, verses 27 and 28. And you're familiar with the story. But let's look at it again. Daniel answered the king and said, No wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show to the king the mystery that the king has asked. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. And he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. All right, hold it right there just for a sec. Who is King Nebuchadnezzar? He's king of Babylon. He's not a believer in the God of Israel. 
He's a pagan king, an idol worshiper. All right? Keep that little tidbit in mind. And let's look at the next sentence, the last sentence of verse 28. And I want you to look at it very carefully in whatever translation you have. He says, your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in bed are these. Now, as I read that in the Aramaic language, it jumped out at me because Uncle Arthur had always told me that Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and Daniel had a vision. Get that? Dream, vision. Ordinary, supernatural. But notice what it said, your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in bed are these. Now that bothered me a little bit, but not nearly as much until I looked at Daniel 7. Daniel 7 and verse 1. And I discovered in the Aramaic language exactly the same words. Let's look at them in the English. Daniel 7 and verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw what? A dream and visions of his head as he lay in his bed. Does that sound familiar? In the original language, it's identical with Daniel 2.28. You see, whatever experience it was that Daniel had, Nebuchadnezzar had it too. They both had the same supernatural experience. Although he was a pagan king, God treated Nebuchadnezzar the same as the Hebrew prophet. I'm not so sure that was a good idea. But God didn't ask me. He went ahead and did it without my permission. I mean, you could say, God, you know, is that a good idea? You know, people are going to say, well, you know, where are the lines? You've got to have some boundaries here. But what I learned from that, my first adult lecture, so to speak, what I learned from that is God is more open-minded than I am. As I studied the Bible in the original language, as I reread Daniel as an adult, I discovered a God who cares about pagans. A God who cares just as much for people who don't care about him. A God who died for the lost. Jesus said, I did not come for those who are well, I came for the sick. I did not come for the saved, I came for the lost. When you're reaching up, who are you reaching up to? You're reaching up to a God who loves people where they are. Do you love people where they are? Do I love people where they are? Irritating, difficult, perverse sometimes, blasphemous. God loves people where they are. You know, sometimes we put God in a box. We say, well, this is God. I've come to understand God. Here's God. I want to share him with you. Here's my God. And my wife gave a corollary to that once. She says, you know, the God that we serve, if people put him in a box, he'll just get in the box with them. He'll meet them there. That's beautiful. Except for one more thing. If you've got God in a box, he's going to shatter the box. Because God is not limited to the boxes that we might put him in. God is not limited to the picture of him that we might have today. God is a God who can come down to a pagan king and give him a vision of the future. And I guess the safest thing for us to do is to let God be God. 
Let the God of the Bible be as he is portrayed to be. Don't attempt to make God over into your image. And that same God that came to Nebuchadnezzar, what was his message to Nebuchadnezzar? How did God present himself to Nebuchadnezzar? Have you seen that statue out there? What is that? It's an idol. That's what the Aramaic word means, image. If you work that word in its Hebrew parallels through the Bible, it's about idolatry. And if you don't believe that, remember that in chapter 3, what does Nebuchadnezzar do? He sets it up and asks everybody to worship it. And if you still don't believe me, rumor has it that some people have been bowing down to that image already. <laughs> you see, why would God do that? Once again, he didn't ask my advice. When God spoke to Nebuchadnezzar, he spoke to him in the form of an idol. Why would he do that? Because to Nebuchadnezzar, the gods of the nations, the nations of the world were beautiful, shining representations of the gods they worshipped. For Nebuchadnezzar, there was no distinction between Babylon and the gods of Babylon. And when he saw that idol, he recognized immediately, connected that with the powers of the world. And so when he made it all of gold, he was trying to show, I'm the only power that matters. The gods of Babylon are the only gods that mattered. So the future of the world was portrayed to Nebuchadnezzar in the form of an idol. Why? Because God meets people where they are. God came to Nebuchadnezzar and gave him a message in a form that he could understand. That's the kind of God we serve. It's a God who meets us where we are, a God who loves us where we are. He doesn't leave us where we are, but he meets us there. I remember a friend of mine, his name was Joe. And there was a time in Joe's experience when he was on drugs, and when he also liked some really, really tough rock music. And there was one day when he was smoking marijuana, he was lying down on a couch, he was smoking marijuana, and he was listening to the Rolling Stones. I can see this is an older generation. You might have forgotten them, all right? But as Joe put it, I was stoned on the stones. Is he an evangelistic prospect at this moment? I don't think so. But God meets people where they are. As Joe was smoking and listening to the music, suddenly the face of Jesus appeared to him in the ceiling. So he's looking up. And he saw Jesus up there, and Jesus pointed down at him and said, when this song is over, you belong to me. The song ended. He put out the cigarette, got off that couch, and signed up to go to seminary and study for the ministry. And that's where I met him. <laughs> that's where I met Joe. You see, God meets people where they are. People that you and I would give up on, God has not given up on them. That's the kind of God that we serve. And I know that there are some of you here whose hearts are heavy. Your hearts are heavy because children and grandchildren and nieces and nephews and husbands and wives and sisters and brothers and parents don't know the Lord. I want you to know we serve a God who loves people where they are, who meets people where they are. Never give up praying for others. No matter how long it takes, never give up 
working for them, praying for them, pleading with God for them. Never give up. And even more than that, never give up on yourself. Because we serve a God who loves people just like you when you're at your darkest. 4.30 in the morning, when you think nobody cares, when you think nothing you've ever done matters. I have thoughts like that at 4.30 in the morning too. Fortunately, I'm usually asleep. But if I wake up early, you know, and the system is low, you begin having these strange thoughts, you know, and at that point you feel like, well, you know, what does it all mean? At times like that, don't give up on yourself. God has not given up on you. That's the message I learned from Daniel 2 as an adult. But let's go back to Daniel some more. And let's go to Daniel 7. Because you see, God comes to Nebuchadnezzar and he gives him a vision about four kingdoms followed by the kingdom of God. He gives Daniel the same vision. But to Daniel, it doesn't come in the form of an idol. To Daniel, it's very different. Let's take a closer look. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 2. Daniel 7 verse 2. It says there, Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. Now, something you need to know here. In the Aramaic and Hebrew languages, the word for wind and the word for spirit is the same. There's no difference. So when a Middle Easterner of that time hears a wind is stirring up the sea, where does their mind go? Creation. Genesis 1 verse 2. The sea was without form and without shape. What does that mean? In Genesis 1 2. It means it's the ocean. The waves come and go. It has no shape. It, it, it has no form. It's a, it's a stormy sea. And it said the Spirit of God was moving on the waters in Genesis 1-2. You see, translators can do what they want. But it's the same word in the original. The Spirit moving on the waters in Genesis 1 and the wind blowing over the waves in Daniel 7. It's the same. It's an echo of creation. And then verses 3 and on, it says, Four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. So follow the story. You have a stormy sea. You have animals that appear. And now, watch what happens next. Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed." Now, I have a question for you. Who is the Son of Man? Did I hear Jesus? That's a good Adventist answer. Remember, we're taking a new look at Daniel. Who is this Son of Man? You're right. It's a foreshadowing of Jesus, no question about it. But based on what? Stormy sea? Animals appear, and now there's a human figure that has dominion over the animals, dominion over the earth. Who is the Son of Man? So remember, Daniel hadn't met Jesus yet. But he saw the Son of Man, and he's thinking, Adam. 
Now, that still connects with Jesus, doesn't it? Because Jesus was what? A second Adam. The last Adam. Okay? So you discover that what the New Testament does with Jesus, it's already happening in the Old Testament. Within the Old Testament itself, you have typology. You have an original Adam, and now you have a second Adam. So Daniel's vision is the same as Nebuchadnezzar. There's four kingdoms followed by the kingdom of God. But what's the difference? To Nebuchadnezzar, that vision is shaped in the form of an idol. To Daniel, it takes the form of creation, something he's very familiar with. Creation becomes the context for the story. And what was God's message? to both of these. It's the same message. You see, Nebuchadnezzar, he thought he was in control. He thought he was in charge. And what does God do? He says, Nebuchadnezzar, I'm the one who sets up kings and takes them down, not you. I'm in charge, not you. You think you're in charge, but you're not. Daniel, 40 years later, has watched Babylon walk all over God's people. And he's got to be saying to himself, you know, they're walking all over us. Their king is getting all the visions from God. Up until this point, Daniel didn't have a vision on his own. This is 40 years after Daniel 2. So I can imagine Daniel saying to God, you know, what's going on here? Everything is out of control. And what's God's message to Daniel? It's not out of control. Nebuchadnezzar's not really in control. I'm in control. Just as Adam had dominion over the animals in the Garden of Eden, so my son of man, when he comes, will have dominion over these nations that are hurting your people. I'm in control, Daniel. Everything's going to be all right. You see, God himself shapes the message. You know, we realize that the gospel can take more than one form. We realize that kind of. This is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? But that's still Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But in Daniel 2 and 7, who is it that shapes the message? It is God who does it. Before the vision ever comes to Nebuchadnezzar, before the vision ever comes to Daniel, God himself is saying, I know this person, and I'm going to shape the message so that he can understand it. I'm going to bring it home in a form that he can appreciate and act upon. That's the kind of God we serve. It is a God who meets people where they are. It is a God who is willing to take the extra step in order to be understood. The basic message is the same, but the language is different. Why? Because the two prophets were very different. And so as you study Bible prophecy, you want to keep in mind that God meets people where they are. Daniel and Revelation are not the same. It's the same God that gives the message, but the prophets are located at a different time and place. And so the visions are different because of that. It is God who meets people where they are. And there's a beautiful text in 1 Corinthians, if you'd like to go there. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, that illustrates the reach out part of this. That just as God is one who meets people where they are, he invites us to do the same. 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 19. 1 Corinthians 9, 19. I have the English Standard Version. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became, what? As a Jew, in order to win the Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, 
not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. So Paul here is laying it down. Just as God meets people where they are, Paul says, you want to reach people, you need to meet them where they are. So that's a new look at Daniel. Looking at the same text, but through a different lens. What's the payoff? What are some of the benefits we get reading Daniel as an adult? First of all, for me, a beautiful blessing for this was the realization that God is in control. Even when things seem out of control, God is still in control. And we can say that knowing that God is someone who will not put us in a place that we can't handle. We don't have to be fearful of God's control but realize it is the control of one who cares about us and wants what is best for us. You know what I found out? When I worry, most of the time, worry is about the future. You realize that? You worry because you don't know what is coming. You worry about the future. And I remember when I received the call to go to Loma Linda University. It was a very, very difficult call because in Michigan where we were, Michigan is a very low cost of living kind of place. Uh, we bought a house for $60,000 in Michigan. That is not a bad house. I think it was 2,700 square feet. I mean, it's a nice house. But you see, low cost of living. And after 25 years there, we'd paid off the house. We didn't know anything. And if I retired in Michigan and something happened to me, my wife could live on about $1,000 a month because the house was free and clear and the little apartment there paid off all the taxes and the, and the utilities. It was a great situation. In Loma Linda, small shacks were selling for 500000 My house in Michigan wasn't even a down payment. That worried me. Everything was going the other way. I was going from a place of complete financial security to a place where everything was up in the air. And I didn't even know at that point that a year after I bought my house in California, its value would be less than half of what I paid for it. I didn't even know that and I was worried. You see? We worry because we don't know the future. And the beautiful thing about the God of Daniel is he makes, brings the message home in two completely different ways. He says, I'm in control. When things appear to be out of control, I'm still in control. When you can't see a future, I still see a future. When you don't know where things are going, I know where they're going. And the move to Loma Linda came to the place where I said, you know, I'm going to have to trust that God will take care of us. Amen. But although I've studied the Bible all my life, I struggle with that. I want you to know that. I want you to know that there's no saint up here who's got all his problems figured out. But it's someone who's learning and growing from the Word of God every day. And God taught me lessons there that he truly is in control. You see, the prophecies of Daniel can be an intellectual thing. Like, oh, I'm no longer curious about the future because I know, you see. But that's not what prophecy is about. Prophecy is to teach us what God is like. Teach us that we can trust him with our futures. And when we know that God is in control, we can live in peace, even though the economy is crashing around us. And that's the God that I've learned to know first in Daniel and second in California. A second payoff from reading Daniel as an adult 
is the discovery that there's more than one right way to think. Who was right, Nebuchadnezzar or Daniel? Who had the truth about God? They were both right. They both had the message of God. But it was radically different in form. Both were right. And it would be easy for somebody to say, well, Daniel had the right one, Nebuchadnezzar, you know, something wrong with that. Or others might put it the other way. But the point is, the Bible teaches us there's more than one right way to think. How many Gospels are there in the New Testament? Four. Four different ways of telling the story of Jesus. The same story of Jesus, but told in four different ways. You see, there's more than one right way to think. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that every way is right. I'm simply saying the truth can be told in a variety of different ways. There's more than one right way to think. And I think that's a very, very important concept. Because if we believe there's only one right way to think, then if you and I think differently, I must be right and you must be wrong. You see? If there's only one right way to think, then every time we disagree, it becomes World War II in the church. And what I've come to learn is if there's more than one right way to think, then maybe that strange idea that somebody's throwing in my ear right now might be something I need to listen to. There might be something there that I don't get right now, but will take me another level toward God. And the beautiful thing about it is when it comes to reaching out, when you reach up to God, you learn how to reach out. And as you're reaching out, discovering there's more than one right way to teach the gospel. Let me tell you a story about toothpaste. I learned a few years back that there were three brands of toothpaste that really used the same ingredients. One of them is called Colgate. You've heard of it? In fact, that's the one toothpaste I think you'll find in every country on earth. Colgate emphasizes maximum fluoride protection. All right, Colgate is out there for the health nuts. People who worry about the health of their teeth. Okay? It's maximum fluoride protection. There's another toothpaste. It's called Close Up. That's for the romantic types. People who like to get close up. And people who get close up worry about what? Their breath. Okay? So, close up has the same ingredients, the same fluoride protection as Colgate. But it emphasizes the breath fresheners. Colgate has the same breath fresheners, but it doesn't emphasize that, you see. There's a third toothpaste called Ultra Bright. That's for the vain people. You know, people who are thinking about how they look and they want their teeth to be ultra bright. You see? So, ultra bright has the same fluoride and the same breath fresheners as the other two. Then why have three brands? Because you'll reach more people that way. You'll sell more product. It's the same product, but formed and marketed in three different ways. That's what I see in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. By the way, I shared that story once. A little old lady came up to me afterward. She said, Pastor, which toothpaste do you use? <laughs> And you know what I told her? Whichever one is cheapest. Because if they're all the same, I'll take the one that says 88 cents over the one that says 279, and you can go to Walmart and figure out which of those it is. I'm not vain. <laughs> all right. 
So there's more than one right way to think. That's a beautiful thing when it comes to reaching out, but it's also important to reaching in, to sharing within the church. Because if there's only one right way to think, then we're constantly going to be fighting with each other. Whereas if we realize there's more than one right way to think, more than one right way to share the gospel, then we learn to listen to each other. We learn to appreciate the differences. We discover that people who do things differently may have a reason for that. That can be a blessing to us. We learn to affirm the truth on both sides of the issue. Even the enemy is partly right about something most of the time. And this inclusive approach can help us to achieve the unity that Jesus prayed for in John 17. I would that they might be one, even as we, Father, you and I, are one. But perhaps the most important thing I learn about God is that he meets people where they are. That God cares so much about people that he becomes one of them. He becomes a Jew in the first century, in Palestine, specific time, place, ethnicity, etc. He truly joined us where we were. God loves us where we are and meets us where we are. And that's the reach out message of Daniel. As we reach out to others, seek to meet them where we are. Because everybody comes from a different direction. I have three children. They're all grown up now. But I remember when they were small. They each learned differently. I remember one night, I was reading a story to my children about a bunny hopping through the forest. Okay? And it was on those picture books. Now here's what happened. As I was reading the story about the bunny hopping through the forest, my oldest daughter was repeating everything I said. I'd read a sentence and she'd start saying it over again. And of course, what does a good father do? You say, quiet. I'm reading the story, not you. You sit there and be quiet. I didn't know anything about learning styles back then. You see, she is what you call an auditory learning style. She learns through the ear. She hears it once when I say it. She hears it twice when she repeats it. And then she will never forget it. If my daughter saw a funny movie when she was seven, she can still recite the lines today because it came through the ear. It's the lines, maybe the visual part she's forgotten, but the lines, the, the punch lines, she never forgets that. She learns through the ear. My son, the middle child, what does he do when he hears the story of the bunny hopping through the forest? He comes running up, jumps on the arm of the chair, grabs the book out of my hands, because he wants to see the picture of the bunny hopping through the forest. He's visual. And of course, what does a good father do? grabs the book back and says, you go back to your seat. I'm reading this story. I was a dumb father. <laughs> Learned a little bit now, working on it. Third child. She hears me read the story of the bunning hoppy through the forest. She's what you call a kinetic learner. What is she doing while I'm reading the story? <laughs> Now, what's a school teacher going to do with these three children? You see the problem? I think just by the very way we structure schools, sometimes we make it a little bit harder for, for many of the kids to learn. But, but how are you going to do that when you have such diverse learning styles? God says, meet people where they are. And that means listening first. Get to know your neighbors. Get to know the people who serve you at Walmart, people who serve you in the grocery store, wherever it is that you go. Get to know the people, your relatives, your friends who don't know the Lord. Listen to them. 
Learn where they're coming from. Jesus spent time with people. He listened to them. The Samaritan woman led him all over the place with her story. And he followed her story until he came to the place where he knew that she was ready to listen. Meeting people where they are means knowing where they are. And God invites us to enter into the lives of the people just as he does. If you want some practical help with these kinds of concepts, uh, there's a book at the ABC. I was very gratified to notice that they had six of my books there. But the one that's being featured this week is called Everlasting Gospel, Ever-Changing World. And it's about why the young people today are so different. And because they're so different, we're tempted to think that they're wrong. And yet, in some ways, they may have a clearer view of the Bible than we do. I'll, t I'll give you just one example of that. You see, my generation got used to thinking of the Bible as a repository of 28 fundamental beliefs. Unfortunately, the Bible's not structured that way. It would be nice if the Bible had 28 books, one for each of the fundamental beliefs, right? <laughs> but that's not the way the Bible's structured. That's the way my generation thinks. The younger generation is into stories. And when they read the Bible, they read it for the story. Well, guess what? What is the Bible? It's a collection of stories and poems. And the truths of the Bible, those 28 fundamental beliefs, are embedded into the stories, into the poems, into the various narratives. And I wonder if this younger generation may not see the Bible more clearly even than we did. Because God works with people where they are. My prayer for you is that God will place upon your heart a deep love for your neighbors, relatives, and friends. My prayer is that you will come to see your neighbors, relatives, and friends through God's eyes. That you see them with the love that he has for them the compassion that he has for them. Because as we allow the God who loves us so much, the God who loved us where we were before he brought us where we are, the God who met us where we were at just the right time and in just the right place, as we have come to love that God, that God can help us to love others the way he does. And that is my prayer for you. Let's pray. Dear Lord, the Bible is challenging to us because the Bible comes from you. And you've told us that your thoughts are not our thoughts that your ways are not our ways. And as we actually open your word and let it soak into our minds, it's going to challenge us. It's going to disturb us. It's going to cause us to think some things through. But we thank you, Lord, that you never stop growing us, that you never stop teaching us. And Lord, tonight I pray that you would draw near to each one of us here that you would bring to our minds and hearts a knowledge of neighbors, friends, relatives that need you. That you would give us a love for them that you have for them. You'd give us an understanding of their heart and of their needs, just as Jesus did when he was among us. It is my prayer that as we are touched by the love that you have for them, we would become more and more like you as we reach out to them. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.